All right. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I've just been handed what's the line from there's a line. Anyways, from like Anchorman? From Anchorman, yeah. Okay. Someday we should recreate. Awesome. That. Let's talk. That would be kind of funny. Maybe for Halloween. That'd be, be fun. Oh, that'd be fun. Okay. Um, awesome. We talk about your tech hours this week. Yeah. Well, I will because I have the mic actually. Uh, Austin's gonna have all of these open tech hours, so hopefully you guys can just pop in any of these days. They're all on the other calendar on pwppagents.com. Um, so you don't have to memorize those, but it's all different times. Just so Austin will be ready to help you with command. There's so many cool and new and exciting things going on in command. Austin's there to help. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. The Legion huddle, Tanya and some others have been doing the Legion huddle every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Just a quick huddle to get motivated for Legion and anyone can come. Share best practices. Hi, Bradley. Come on in. Front and center is available. <laughs> <laughs> Bradley. The front row is available. Oh, my God. Everybody meet Bradley. He's an engine at our office. <laughs> I'm oh. excited. Out there. It is a good day. The sun's <laughs> out. The sun is out. This is a really good CE class this week. So, um, hosted by Tycho Title, and it's here creative financing and closing solutions. So just different financing options um, with the market that we're in. And is it, this is going to be taught by Academy? Is that yeah, correct? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. He's here. In this room. And again, please register just so there's a good count for food. Um, Josh, you just said you're teaching, you're teaching this. So I'm assisting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> teaching this yes cool so, right um, josh is assisting to touch on some of the stuff that uh, uh like whitehead started talking about at the beginning of the year also in terms of like seller, seller or, uh carry right cool. well. this is and this is so important this is so good such good information in this market right like you need to know what other options are available even if you don't know everything about them you need to know what's available yeah i would just add to this yeah. um you know, uh, I've, in my career, I've had a lot of people come through open houses or get, get referred to me by somebody I sold a house to that were stumbling as to how they could buy a house. They'd been told they couldn't by going to some lender or by some parent or friend said they're not eligible. And I would ask them if they would take the time to talk to my lender and I would refer them to the equivalent of Josh. And um, they suddenly realized that they could buy a house. And they would say, let's go. We want to buy a house. And so part of it is, if you think about the advantages of a mortgage broker versus a, an in-house lender like a Wells Fargo, a U.S. Bank, a Bank America lender, they're in-house. They only sell the products for that company. Mortgage brokers like Academy and Josh, the reason they're here is because they have how many different products? Like 30, did you guys say? Yeah. Yeah, and they they change probably every other day, right? You get some new investor that says, I'm willing to do this, right? right? So and so the reason, so that means you can basically qualify people that, they, that in-house lenders for banks can't even qualify because they don't have the flexibility in the products. And so that's why these guys are here. And I know I got a little out of control, according to my son last week, but we are entering possibly the last best time to buy real estate in the next few years, because we're going to see some inflation and not quite sure how they're going to stop at this time. And so real estate will inflate. And so investing in real estate, owning a home has always been good. This is probably better. We got to get back the uh, wealth building series back on the calendar. Yeah, maybe. So I thought here. about it because I uh, was talking to Cameron and he said, you have to get off your holy pulpit about buying real estate and owning real estate. So, so you need to double down. So I thought, <laughs> yeah, double down on that. So I thought, okay, well, I just teach my class then. I'll teach well, my class again. 
It's passion. You have passion about real estate, real estate investing. Well, it changed my life, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. Because I want you folks to all start buying real estate to change your lives. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how you do it. You know, the majority of, of millionaire billionaires in the world are real estate owners. And we're in the business, for God's sake. So yeah. we, we are the ones that are supposed to be the ones that know. When is the best time to buy real estate? Now, uh, question. It's always now. I I knew that was a or, trick question. Ten years ago, or, like they say, ten years ago, right? It's always ten years ago. The last time to buy was always ten years ago. So yeah. buy now, buy now. Don't wait. There's nothing to wait for. Okay. I like that. Okay. The next thing happening. Oh, wait, this is an extra fun slide. So tomorrow at three o'clock, if you're on the list, go to Tumwater. It's going to be really fun. There's a big charcuterie, wine. Beautiful building, beautiful people. Maybe a sunny day. I don't know. Uh, Austin's promised Coffee. sun. Um, but if you're not on the list, we're going to do another contest for second quarter. We don't know what it's going to be yet, but something to help everyone get a little bit more motivated, just a little extra nudge. We are just trying to get the year rolling and keep it going. So congratulations to everyone who had a listing in January or February and is on the list. And we'll see you tomorrow. Sunny and 60. <gasps> mm -hmm. Or the cloudy. I said, no, I only heard sun. <laughs> sunny I only and heard 60. Sun. Sunny and 60, says. beautiful. I've got sunny. my phone dialed into the correct. It is indoor and outdoor, so. They have a really cool water feature outside, so <laughs> if it's sunny, then it'd be fantastic. If you just say it's going to be sunny, it worked. remember that the one I year do. during COVID? I remember that. We had an awards in the parking lot. We yep. went all out, and everyone kept saying, well, what if it's raining? And it won't. It didn't. It's not going to rain. And it didn't. Because we, we put just it put there. it out there. Didn't run. Okay, next slide. Social roundtable. This is Thursday, eleven to twelve in this room, and is it also on Zoom, Austin, or just in person only? And if you have never gone to this, it's great. Rochelle is a social media expert, all kinds of followers. Sometimes she'll like see these other classes on social media experts, and she'll say, "Oh, they don't even have that many followers." Is she on? No, Rochelle, you want to say what's your class about tomorrow? Because she really has a ton, a huge following and maximizes social media. Yeah, good morning. If you have any social media questions or you want to see like a live demo on how to make a reel, this is a good time to come to the class. I do step-by-step um, -step guidance for whatever it is that you have questions about. So we do the round tables because in that way, everybody can just come with questions on different platforms. Um, and then if you come with no questions, I just start talking social media. <laughs> Sweet. So cool. And there's so much to know with the algorithms and just how to get that visibility, right? You could have the best content, but if no one's seeing it. At a minimum, yeah, it's that's place true. You the kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. And my biggest advice about social media, if you take nothing away, think about it as like going to the gym. You don't just walk into a gym and be like, well, I'm here. Why am I not skinny? It's the same thing as with social media. You can't just post once and be like, oh, I got no clients out of it. It's all about consistency and um, strategic planning. I love that. I love that. That's a great tip. Because sometimes we all want those immediate results. And it's like the least expensive social, I mean, least marketing. expensive marketing you can do, period. True. And okay. maybe like the way you can touch those people. I love it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thursday, 11 o'clock, you do not have to register. You just show up. Next one, Austin. Okay, this is exciting. We have another new discount for you guys. So Macadam Floor and Design is offering some really good discounts to us and our clients. So they'll tell us more about it when we go there in two weeks. But the discount is 25% for our clients and 35% for you guys. Um, and, you know, we have our discounts at contractors furnishings mart and they're great that's where like the builders go and they have a list of installers that you hire macadam floors for like maybe your clients who don't want to have to like coordinate everything right they have more like they have the installers on the staff they have designers on like on the staff too so it's just both are great options for different types of people different types of um projects so we just want to give you guys more options and yeah they have a great new showroom just right up the street off of Jean Road. So not next week, but the following week, we're going to do our team weekly meeting there. So there will not, not be a Zoom. So we just wanted to make sure we told everyone about this now. So plan on being at Macadam Floor, 10 a.m. It's like 
less than it's like five minutes away, maybe less than that. And they're going to provide breakfast, coffee, and we'll get to just meet some other team, hear more about their discount and uh, take a look at their new showroom. Yeah, I think I think one of the differences, so they're a warehouse too, and I've, I've used them before. Mm -hmm. I think one of the differences um, is that they they literally will install for you, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you, you go and you pick out whatever you want and they'll send the installers to install it. Whereas CFM, you have a choice. So CFM would be, well, I don't know anyone. And so I'm going to go in there and pick it. And they have a few people that they can refer me to. And they have a few designers that they can refer me to if I want. And so for the builders, uh, my builders, you know, would be a choice. Do you want to use Macadam and their installers? Or do we have a favorite installer, you know, that does that we like, right? And so they, but they both are warehouse style. They both have phenomenal selections. And um, Macadam has been around for probably 20 years, I think. Mm -hmm. for a while so yeah and CFM they just opened can... their showroom um they had the one on macadam right but now it's just right up here and it's a new showroom and it's nice and was pretty. that the one we're going to yeah the oh, new cool. one. yeah and so also they'll be able to do client parties kind of similar to cfm you know the more partners we can provide to offer you guys discounts and for your family and friends and clients the more you can talk about it the more we can talk about it um so put that on your calendars though two weeks from now no zoom just meet there at 10 a.m and Josh and excuse me, Academy Mortgage are starting a book club. Josh, come tell everyone about that. All right. That is fun. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay. Book club. Come all the way so you they can see you on Zoom. Oh, okay. All right. Hi Zoom as well. Mm -hmm. So all right, so this is not specifically mortgage related, but uh, having <laughs> had such a great experience with the last book club okay. yes. um, that uh, Julie and Zhao um, put on, um, I offered to spearhead this next one. So in a lot of the people that you guys have brought in as the market center to uh, talk about coaching and habit building and that kind of thing, they all refer to this book, Atomic Habits, and they're always talking about it. And I'm like, well, I've never actually read it. And uh, whenever they ask, you know, who's read this? And a couple of hands go up here and there. Um, and I thought, well, if everybody's referring to this, and it's such a huge foundation for what a lot of folks use for their coaching programs and stuff, I thought this would be a great book for, um, for us to read and learn together. So uh, Atomic Habits, there's a QR code to sign up. It's an Eventbrite. It's free. Sign up. We're going to provide the books for you. Oh, that's awesome. um, mm -hmm. We've got a couple weeks to sign up. The first class is going to be on April 4th, um, immediately preceding the team meeting. So they're going to be on Tuesdays, um, every Tuesday from 11 to noon. We're going to meet at the uh, conference room. Uh, number one up front. Um, we already have that reserved. Cool. And um, I have it scheduled through the end of May. I doubt, I doubt if we're meeting every week, it's probably not going to take us quite that long to get through it, but uh, um, just in case. So don't feel like you have to come every week. Uh, you know, life happens. You got to take care of your business, obviously, but uh, would love to get as many people signed up as possible um we're going to kick it off on the fourth that's when we'll uh when, um, i'll have an idea as how many people are coming and so i'll be able to provide books and stuff at that time mm -hmm. so. you're not a big reader book clubs are great because they can help you give you that motivation to keep it going and you know a lot of the smartest business people in the world are big readers and this is a great book i've read it before but again when you do it in a group setting in a book club people uncover different things and you uncover different things. So I think Absolutely. this is a great choice. And if you want to get it on Kindle, you can always get, get it on Kindle if you prefer a, or not Kindle, uh, like audible. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you can get the audio audio book too, if you prefer to listen to it. So, so um, we're going to be at McAdam on the porch. Mm -hmm. 10. Yeah. 10 to 11. So we might have to start at like 11. Back, 11. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe we can move it back on that. Yeah, like 10 or 15, 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah, 10, 15 minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. 
I'll be cool. here. We're here. Yeah. Well, we're not far away. <laughs> so we sign up, and then you provide a book, and we show up on the first one. And yep. you get the book on the first one. Yeah. Okay. So we'll kick it off then, you know, and then you know get some, um, you know, reading, uh, reading assignment started, and then the next week we'll cool. go into our first, uh, first reading. So cool, Austin. Can you pop the link in the chat too, please? Cool, Josh. I think thank it's a great book hosting. to start this off I with. Think so too. Too. I think it's a really good book. I've read parts of it, and it's a lot of good comments and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. While you're up here, you want to tell us about mortgages and lending and what the heck's going on? Sure. So um, we started having some great, uh, you know, improvement towards the end of last week with some uh, uh, with some rates. We're seeing mortgage bonds improve um, over the weekend. Of course, uh, um, everybody started getting worried again about the banking system um, and uh, Things started to go a little bit downhill again yesterday. It actually started off really well, um, uh, improving over Friday, but then by the end of the day, um, we lost some ground and this morning even sort of started off that. So bottom line is we're gonna continue to see lots of volatility in um, rates and in the market. So don't let the, um, that stop your folks. Get them pre-approved, get them a budget, just make sure you know whoever they're working with as their lender, you know, make sure they understand that this is sort of your range, right? Rates are here today. They can be up here, you know, tomorrow. Let's get you under contract. We can either float or, you know, or not, you know, lock depending on where things are. So um, I met with a gal that uh, in my office yesterday that I had pre-approved and I sat down with her, went through several different scenarios showing, okay, yeah, you have this much money for, you know, down payment. Um, you can get to 20% down or you can buy the rate down um, and do 15% down with a one-time, you know, premium MI. We did that. We uh, illustrated it and it actually showed the payment, you know, like $200 a month, you know, less. And she was bringing in $10,000 less to closing doing it that way. Um, so just making sure that they understand that they have options. How do we get there? How do we make it so that you can get into, you know, real estate now, like you were talking about um, before, you know, uh, before it's not an option for them. And, um, you know, um, so that they really understand sort of uh, what's the best option for them. You can refinance later if they need to. Uh, there are a lot of great products out there. Um, still lots of good first time um, home buyer programs, zero down. I've got an FHA one that uh, um, is a down payment assistance program with no uh, first time home buyer requirement. Um, so people can uh, use it again if they need to. Cool. So just lots of great options. Okay. Just keep after folks, keep talking to them um, and uh, um, make sure you communicate you know, with them and their lenders as well. Yeah, and like, yeah, word of the wise, like if you're working with a buyer and they aren't having these kinds of conversations with their mortgage broker, you need to move them to a new broker. Send them over to Josh. He'll take good care of them. Like I, I've done this in my own business. Like I've seen, I've, I've looked at clients who have, this is when the market was really hot and they had some, you know, Acme mortgage company or something like that. I'm like, look, we're going into a competitive market here. We need to have a mortgage broker that other people recognize and can bank on. And that's why I chose in a hot market to do that. Conversely, in this market, where there may not be the same competition, that their their lock their their qualifications could be a moving target based upon the uh, interest rates in the middle of the day. So, like, you need to be making sure that your people are having good conversations with their mortgage people because who wants to get in contract, spend money only to find out they don't qualify after a week and a half on, of uh, spending money on appraisals or home inspections or whatever. So, Absolutely. yeah. So. Anyway, you guys know where to find me if you ever need anything. Um, my office, oh, well, it used to be next to Tanya's. No, she moved away from me. Sorry. So. <laughs> next to Ted and Lauren. Now it's next to Ted and Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. They're the best seat in the house. Right? Um, yes. um, and so what should, what kind of conversations can our agents have with their clients if they are, uh, they, they're they fearful of all the um that the banks are all the banking system's gonna all go down or you know it's too risky of a time what kind of conversations can we have i mean if they have if clients have so much money in the market in, in the bank that they're worried about their deposits mm -hmm. specifically aren't going to be covered then you know they've got a that's a good problem for them to have so that's probably a different conversation but um 
for you know the folks that are concerned about getting into the market the you know the conversation hasn't really changed that much in the fact that you know yes rates have come up but in times of recession you know in times of you know um, sort of economic turmoil that's when we see rates come down and as we've previously discussed you know in these meetings you know real estate continues to be sort of that shiny marker other than perhaps that blip in 2008 that we had um real estate continues to perform mm -hmm. and so when we see rates come down again um you know in the future that's when we're going to see that competition bump back up so they need to continue having those conversations figure out how to get you in now and then we can you can lower your payments later when rates do come down I mean, you remember back in 2008 when that happened, and a lot of folks were having a hard time staying at their house. The government came out with the HARP program, you know, and that allowed that folks to refinance into the really low rates without having to um, do all the regular qualifications. So talk to them now. Inflation is going to continue to happen. We're going to continue seeing the house prices go up, but rates may come down, which is going to push, you know, prices, you know, um, more. So, and with the low inventory, it's, you know, it's still better to get in now and refinance later. Um, there's still options out there. You can still do, you know, the buy down, the temporary buy downs with seller help. Um, there's some arm programs that are available. Um, so just keep, just keep reminding them, you know, does this work for you? If it does, if this payment, you know, in some amount, you know, gets in, gets you in now, does that work for you? And then, uh, you know, later, if you want to refinance, that's fine. Uh, because later they're going to end up paying more for that house. You know, they might not be able to afford it or they may be, you know, not be competitive anymore. Right. Awesome, mm -hmm. Josh. Well, thank you for the update. And any other questions on Lundy? Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Yep. All right, Austin. <laughs> Are you going to show us some stuff in command? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, we've had some demand for something and we finally did it. Uh, so we, uh, Tanya and I have been working and trying to figure out how we can make this happen um, where we can provide all the agents in the office a free provided monthly newsletter where you can just pretty much grab it from command, put it into your own and send it out to your clients every month. Um, and so let me show you, let me switch over the camera. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to pull this over. Okay. So in command, who who's familiar with smart plans? Has anyone ever tapped into the smart plans? Okay, perfect. So smart plans, you can create your own at any time. You can, there's sky's the limit. Uh, there's always room for improvement. They're rolling updates out on a regular basis, um, but you can also publish your smart plans and you can actually grab anyone else's smart plan that they've published. And if you want to do that, you can just go over here to the library and you can go and search whether by smart plan name or smart plan description or the author and it'll pop up. And so what we decided to do is this is, this is kind of a workaround. This is a method that we can share designs that we've created where you can just pretty much grab them and put them into your own command and send them out. So all you have to do each month is go up to the search bar and type in hashtag KWPP. Once you do that, the only thing that'll show up is our newsletters. And so we have a March newsletter already set up. Um, it's around springtime, but once you add that smart plan to your library, it'll pop up up here and then you can go in and edit and view what it looks like. Uh, so if you go in and click the edit button, you're going to see that it is a email type is a design and the design is housed right here. Once you have that smart plan added to your command, that design is now pulled into your own designs. It is yours to use. You can customize it, change the graphics, change the text, but it is already set up. It has uh, the market center logo um, placeholder, your picture placeholder, everything and that should all populate based off of your marketing profile, what you have for your brand. Um, but what's cool is, yeah, now that you have that, you can go into designs here and see right here, classic happy spring. So let me go click on this. I'll just show you what it looks like. So it just has this KW, floral KW um, graphic. 
and then a you know first day of spring is here it means you might see for sale signs popping up in your neighborhood so it just comes into like here are some things to keep in mind um as the real estate market heats up for the summer and so you can kind of pull this in see what it looks like you can preview it if you want to uh just to see what all the content will look like and if you want to customize it make it your own you're welcome to so now the question is how do i send it to clients um there are two ways the first way is the simple way is just straight through smart plans. All you have to do is while you're in the smart plans right here, you can just click this add contact button and be able to select the tags. I have all agents, but you can select the tags that you want um, or the people that you want and it'll immediately add them to that smart plan and send out that email to them. The downside here is that you will not be able to see the metrics of who opened it, which emails bounced, things like that, which if you prefer that, you wanna see the, the statistics behind the email you'll have to send this through campaigns. So that's another, it's it's a few extra steps, but it's essentially gives you a little bit more features there. So when you go in, I've already set up the draft, but when you go create a campaign, all you have to do is once you're in here, you just drag in that design into here, send it to this recipient list that you've set up and you click send One, or schedule for a specific time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when you want to set up a campaign for a newsletter, all you do is cre click create a campaign. You say, what type of campaign do you want? It's going to be an email there. Now, what's the goal of this email? I'm just going to say test here. Uh, I say brand awareness. It's up to you. You can say other if you want. Um, but I'm going to say brand awareness. Uh, you click create a campaign. Then it pulls open this window. In this window, then you can select the recipient list that you have. If you've already had one created, you just click on it. Otherwise, you create a list here and you would select by a specific tag if you want and then select all those people. And then you put in the subject header like happy spring um, and then you select the design. So it's probably instead of the smart plan being three steps, this is maybe six steps, five steps. Uh, and there it is. So now I can exit out and then boom, it's there. And what's nice about doing it through the campaigns is you can schedule it for a particular time. If there's like a prime time that you want it to be sent out or a specific day, or you can just send it right then and there. And then once that's done and you have it sent out, you'll be able to see the metrics under your emails tab. You'll be able to see how many people opened it, uh, how many bounces, things like that. And then that's that's pretty easy. You can see all that information here, delivered, opened, clicked, if there's links involved, not sent, not opened, things like that. So yeah, so it is available to you. Just go to Smart Plans, type in hashtag KWPP, and every month we will have one available for you. Uh, you know, it may be holiday related. It may be, you know, seasonal to, you know, if there's fun summer events, things going on, that's the idea of it. And to provide you guys with a, you know, a, a newsletter, a touch to your clients. Awesome. And then you and Tony were going to make some ahead of time too and, and put more into one and just like set it and forget it for the quarter. For you can do up to five, five, up to five yeah. months of um, graphic design for the time of this month. Or if you want to see who's looking at it, you can pre schedule out 12 months of but schedule new individual monthly emails, mass emails. Mm -hmm. that, that information is pretty valuable to know who's opening and reading. There is definitely 12 uh, pre templated emails. More than that, if you add in, like, if you want to go out specifically for like tax day. And are you going to hashtag those KWPP? No. No. What should um, you search to find those? Well, because it depends on when they add it, depends on the topic. Oh. Um, if we did five months at a time, what if I grabbed it in two months and it goes into one of the holiday ones? Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, but right. it is and very simple to just do that quick newsletter, especially if you already have an audience ready to go. And then you get to see who opens and who doesn't open. And uh, But the, the emails are ready. Like you don't have to do anything to them. That's awesome. Yeah, some of our agents want to do very customized emails and newsletters. And some of you guys just want to like, what click, 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 boom, a touch mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So um, we're just trying to make things like that easier. If you have any ideas or suggestions, um, bring them to Austin and 
we always want ideas for content. It's, you know, they're for, these are for you guys. So do some commercial ones. That's probably feedback, right? <laughs> um, but awesome. Thank you for showing us that. Does anyone have any questions on command or using those templates for Austin? Okay. And if you do, you can go to his open hours. Um, all right, Kelly. You're yeah, up to I teach us up. something We're about fun. contracts today. Yeah, so um, I thought I've got a couple case studies here to go through with you guys. And then we're going to end up with a post-mortem on a deal. But I thought I'd talk start by talking about the term construction and not like how we build a building, but how we build a term or a, a law or whatever and how it's understood. So um, I Googled this. I'm kind of a dork. I have like a Black's Law dictionary on my phone because I, I like the information. Um, but anyways... Construction, the process or art of determining the sense, real meaning, or proper explanation of obscure or ambiguous terms or provisions in a statute, written instrument, which is what we're talking about, or oral agreement, which I hope we're not talking about, or the application of such subject to the case in question by reasoning in the light derived from extraneous connected circumstances or laws or writings bearing upon the same or a connected matter or by seeking and applying the probable aim and purpose of the provision. It is to be noted that this term is properly distinguished from interpretation, although the two are often used synonymously. In strict interpretation, is limited to the exploring of the written text, while construction goes beyond <clears throat> and may call into the aid of intrinsic considerations as above indicated. So that's a really, really complicated um, um, definition of the word construction. And I think I'm trying to scare you a little bit by it because when you write terms that aren't clear, this is what it goes to. And construction is not something we really want to talk about in depth, but let's talk about. Wait, can you explain that in different, like your own words? So, so if I were to write a term and it would be really ambiguous, the, um, the interpretation of the term could vary between parties. And so in a like lot of necessary. Like necessary repairs. Yeah, exactly. That's a perfect example. So um, buyer to, you know, seller to install new roof and um, install new sheathing as necessary. Well, is who's it necessary to, right? Who's What's it necessary to? So if I'm the buyer and I wrote, I represent the buyer and I wrote that term. Well, because I wrote it, it's my, it's, um, it's my own, it's, it's my, it's my obligation to write something that's clear. So it could be deemed that the buyer, the, the other party's interpretation of that term would trump my own. So their necessity, their necessity is probably different than my buyer's necessity. And so they would probably look at the, the sheathing and go, oh, no, the sheathing's fine, but I don't think it's necessary. And while your buyer may say, well, it is necessary, we wrote it, so we have to own it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I've got a couple of things I've seen over reviewing recently that kind of jumped out to me. And I thought I'd just start with this this one here. So, so this, these are like real life. These are real. So our agents didn't write these, but we may or may not have accepted a term an agreement with these terms in place. So we all write pretty well, but we often accept things we should not accept. Okay, yeah. so this one says, seller to, to contribute a total of 9,660 towards buyer's closing costs and prepays. All other terms and conditions to remain the same. But this one always gets me. So what are we, what what 9,660 things are we contributing? Yeah. Right? Guinea yeah. pigs. Right? Gonna... Okay. Um, <laughs> buyers, it's a lowercase b, which can mean any buyers. It's not specific to the buyers in this agreement, okay? Talk about that again, just because it's been a while. Right, so um, we use capitalized terms to identify larger um, um, concepts in the contract. So a lowercase buyer just means the word buyer. A capital case buyer would mean the buyers that are sp were specifically involved in this transaction. Although it's obvious, right? And we could probably use the um, the theme of construction to, just, to figure out who the buyers are. It just is sloppy and should be corrected. While I'm being nitpicky, I'm going to be nitpicky. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when and where shall the 9,660 whatevers be contributed? It doesn't say at closing. What if it, what if that was $9,666, but we didn't state when it was going to be given? The seller could be like, well, I'll just, and there's a, let's say there's a, um, an occupancy agreement that allows the seller to stay later. So what's the, what if the seller thinks, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll just contribute that when we leave the house. Like you could actually draw a correlation to the two because not saying it closing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, lastly, um, all other, this is my favorite, all other terms and conditions remain the same. My question is whenever I read that, it's like, well, what else would they do? Like we didn't change them. 
Everybody always writes at the bottom. I always think that it's not necessary. Anyways, okay. Let's go to the next one. Also. That's good. Wait, do you want to read how it should be? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is how I would have written this. Seller shall contribute $9,660 at closing towards buyers with a capital B, lenders, and with a capital L, that's also a capitalized term in the agreement, allowable closing costs and prepaid expenses. And so you'll notice that closing costs is capitalized there because, again, it is um, loosely a capitalized term in the sale agreement, but the prepaid expenses are not. And the lender is a capitalized term in the ORIF sale agreement and the Oregon Realtor sale agreement. Good stuff. Anyone else? Ever Riveting written? stuff. Yes. Anyone else right. ever written all terms and conditions for maintain? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You would want us to then return that? I would just, I would probably put in an addendum because it's like, it's just, it's vague. I just think, and like in, we have a duty through the code of ethics to not agree to vague terms. And this is the least vague of the three that we have today, because it's pretty easy to draw a correlation to what they meant. But like when things go sideways is when people start saying they didn't understand terms. And so I always like just to lock things up. It just takes, you know, a few minutes to write an addendum that clarifies that term. Or if you really wanted to put it on a counter offer, you could do that. I mean, I always try to avoid counter offers if I can. So if I was representing the seller on this and I got that that in my offer, I would probably just prepare an addendum and send it over to the buyer. Said, hey, before we agree, I just want you guys to sign this. Yeah, and I tell you the way we've done that is um, when people wrote things were un that were unclear, or even if we didn't agree to it, we would say in a counter, you know, section three, line one eighty two to read. Yeah. And then we would restate exactly the way we wanted to read, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, we might not include all closing costs. We might include, you know, excluding whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's the way we would do it. So it's nice and clean and succinct. You can say, oh, okay, that applies to here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Next one applies to here. And um, this is good timing because I've had two conversations with our agents that have complained about the quality of people they're working with on transactions. Yeah, so, it's really common. Uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we have to do to protect ourselves and our sellers. Yeah, it's unusual that I see a term that we wrote that's not great. A lot of times, though, it's it's from the other party. And we just we have a conversation so we know what it means. But again, the conversation is not part of the agreement. Right. The statute of frauds does everything has to be in writing. Yeah. So if it has to be in writing, let's get it straight. OK. Yeah. And remember, if you're representing your client, you have to change it. You have to clarify. it. Yeah. 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 And I think it, it actually is kind of a, it, it's a good way to, sh to show your mastery to your client. They'll respect you more for making sure you make a clear term for them. Okay. All right. So this next one, this one says, buyer may have a, may have a walkthrough to verify property is substantially the same condition as at the time of offer and that all systems and fixtures are in working order. Does anybody want to take a crack at why this is a mess besides what I wrote? They they capitalize the buyer, but I think that's because it's at the beginning of the, se the sentence. The, the, well, one, I, and I didn't even put this one down here. It says to verify property is substantially the same condition. The, that could be any property, right? Go ahead. Yeah, it's substantial. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep, yep. So um, my my question <laughs> was this, what is, what is the purpose? What is the intent of this covenant? Um, I don't think it's very clear. Um, I, I would guess that maybe the, the agent was thinking, that they do a walkthrough prior to closing to determine if everything's in the same working, but that's, that's a bad, it's like a loaded, loaded bag. Yeah. Brad. Right. And what if it's not exactly. So it says, so, many. so a contingency is not established in this thing. So they created a covenant that's kind of, kind of loose and kind of overarching. It's not a contingency because like what Bradley said, there's no cure. If they were to go through and find that things weren't in the correct condition. Okay. And then when is the walkthrough supposed to take place as a seller? I would say, well, your walkthrough was done the day you did your home inspection. And they would be like, well, no, that's not what we meant. I don't know any other difference. And then, um, and then, like I said, when and where would take place. If I'm representing the seller, what scares this about me the most is that there is, I don't like to have like two people with two separate interpretations on what's going to happen in the transaction. So if the buyer thinks they're going to do a walkthrough, at the, at the end of like two days before closing to make sure everything's in working order. And the seller's like, well, we've already done this walkthrough. We're going to have a problem at closing probably because they're going to ask for access to the property. And the seller's going to be like, well, you already did that. And the buyer's going to be like, well, I'm not closing because you're not going to give me the access you promised me to. So but my problem from the seller's perspective on this is um, you had a home inspection. We negotiated repairs, but this could, this could trump that because everything's supposed to be in good working order at this point. 
unless it's changed otherwise, right? So you figured out that the stove's not in good working order, but the seller may have promised to have the stove in good working order, but it wasn't negotiated as part of the, the inspection and repair agenda. So again, vague, it's bad. I would reject this term altogether. I would just throw it out if I was a, if I was a listing agent on this, I would remove this term from the sale agreement. That's why you'll see no cure to this because I, when I don't think I don't like walkthroughs right before closing, like if somebody wants to do a walkthrough before closing, I'm all for letting them do it, but it has no teeth. I would not have a contractual term that allows us to do a walkthrough before closing. All right, let's go to the next one. That's a good one. Chime in with any questions or Please. comments. Okay, seller to install fully permitted air conditioning unit that is sufficient for square footage. Seller to confirm that the size and type of unit to be installed and must obtain buyer approval prior to installing. As a listing agent, again, I would never accept this term. Um, my issues are, is, did they can, is this a contingency or covenant? It's written as a covenant. So the buyer must somehow agree to something that they don't know what it's going to be in the future, which is difficult to, to wrangle, okay? What if the buyer does not approve of the make home model of the AC unit? What happens then? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's nothing in there. What is the time frame frame for the approval besides before installation? Again, we don't know. When must the AC unit be installed? Doesn't say before closing. <clears throat> Again, who is the buyer? It should be capital B for buyer, right? And then what is the buyer deems a sufficient unit for the square footage is not sufficient, right? Like what if the seller says, I've given you one that is the exactly right size and tonnage for this unit, but you don't like it. There's again, no cure for this term, term, all right? So this is what I would have wrote. <clears throat> Seller shall add an air conditioning unit to the HVAC system prior to closing. This sale is contingent upon the buyer's approval of said air conditioning units, model and size. Buyer and seller shall have 10 business days following the date this offer is signed and accepted to agree in writing on the brand, model and size of the AC unit to be installed. In the event the buyer and seller cannot agree on the AC unit to be installed, this transaction shall be automatically terminated <clears throat> and all earnest money deposit shall promptly be refunded to the buyer. Now that's something that you can actually count on. It's very clear and concise. And yes, it took like four more sentences, but don't you think we should just take the time to get it right? Okay. All right. And I, you made a good point of you have to say what's going to happen. Right. You when people, yeah. something doesn't work. I, 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 I challenge you all when you start filling in spaces that aren't, you know, when you start writing sentences in your sale agreement to really have a lot of forethought into what could happen should this happen or not happen? Like you guys really need to think about the uh, the cause and effect of the things you write. That's good. And if you have any question about it, you should call me because this is what I like to do. Cool. Weird. We have another example. Um, Austin, is Barbara on? Um, let's put a little face up here so everyone in the room can see her. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hold on. Let me see. Okay. I can start a video. Oh, well, thank cool. you. Cool. So Barbara Carboni, and she had a transaction recently where the property manager did not give the proper notice to the tenant. So um, I'm going to let her and Kelly talk yeah. a little bit more about this. Yeah. So I'll just like frame it up a little bit. So Barbara represented both parties in this transaction. And Bar Barbara, you found the buyer before it ever went to market, correct? Correct. <clears throat> this was a, um, a property from a seller that I was already working with that was off market. And I just happened to stumble across the buyer. So it was an off-market deal. Cool. And the property had a tenant in it, correct? Yes, it had a tenant. And so when you guys went into contract, what was it? How, how long was it from when you went to contract to where you were first supposed to close on the property? Um, so we went into contract in June. And given that it had a tenant, according to Oregon law, you have to give them 90 days. So it was 90 days my buyers or the buyers felt most comfortable having the tenants out of the property before closing. Okay. So we, our contract was um, probably more like a hundred days. Cause it was yeah. nine, you know, when right. the contract gave them notice 90 days to closing. So it was supposed to be in September. Yeah. So it's just really smart. That's how you would want to do it. If I was representing a buyer, I wouldn't want to inherit their, their, the seller's tenant if I was moving into the property. So that makes perfect sense. And you had yeah. a property manager, like a professional property manager delivering notice. So yes, the yeah. seller already had a property manager that he's used for many of his rentals. Um, so that that was already in place. And so they as a as a you want to throw up a, the next screenshot here. Me? And if you have a property with the tenant and you're not clear on the Oregon rental 
tenancy uh, policies would definitely want to do so. Yeah, you need to be very clear on these because um, they are there are big consequences to um, things not being handled correctly. So, Barbara, in in your the property manager that represented your seller chose to um, chose to give notice to the tenant. Um, that they had to vacate the property using um, using the the, um, the the statute that if you were doing a big remodel or changes to the property that made it uninhabitable that you could you could have the tenant removed, correct? Correct. Yeah. It was there, did they say why they chose that one? Well, <clears throat> I had started the conversation with the seller about putting the house on the market and that I might have a potential buyer and like we were working towards, but you know, it wasn't, there was nothing in contract, but we were working towards, um, I was prepping him to prep his tenants to put it on the market. Mm -hmm. And so I think he went to his property manager and they kind of sprung into action and the house did need a lot of work and it would have essentially removed anybody that was living in it at the time um, for safety issues. Like the roof need to be completely redone. There was, quite a few other things but so that's what they chose to do um prior to us going into contract right and what what the property manager didn't know though and she delivered the notice how she was supposed to sort of like so she sent yeah. over notice saying hey we're going to do some remodeling of the property and it isn't tenable for you to stay you're going to have to move but what yeah. the statute calls for here and it's listed right here in red in the second the lower part of the page here is it says that a landlord that terminates a tenancy under subsection 5 which is the one above <clears throat> must specifically <clears throat> specifically in the termination notice uh the reason for terminating and the supporting facts so they have to say like you can't just be like hey we're we're going to you know change the electrical panel and because of that you have to move out they ha you have to give like a good reason why um why that would displace somebody from the home. And then two, yes. at the time, or to see here, at the time the landlord delivers the tenant the notice to terminate the tenancy, pay the tenant an amount equal to one month's periodic rent. That's what the statute says. Right. So they you know, yeah, I don't know why this manager wasn't more brushed up on the law. And, you know, especially coming right out of a pandemic, I think they were more used to just having easygoing uh tenants but it, i think the moral of the story anytime you're displacing somebody always plan for a worst case scenario okay. these people were people of means they could have easily bought or rented anything else within days the budget was not an issue for them but they were upset they were not happy they did not want to move yeah. uh so it, it caused problems Absolutely. And before we move on to the next slide, I, I just want to bring up the stuff in green here. And this is how, if I was a property manager, this is probably how I would have terminated the, the, the tenancy. I would have, um, I would have let them know that the landlord has accepted an offer to purchase the dwelling under a separate uh, uh, unit separately from any other dwelling unit from a person who intends in good faith to occupy the dwelling unit as a person's primary residence and provide the notice of written evidence uh, of the offer to the purchase and dwelling unit to the tenant not more than 120 days after accepting the offer to purchase. So that would have been the cleanest way to do it. That's how I would have done it. It made a lot of sense to me that that's how they should have done it, but that's mm -hmm. not how the property manager chose to go about things. And let's go to the next slide here. And so um, what I wanna talk about here is um, in section BA, the last sentence here says, a tenant is entitled to recover under paragraph A of the subsection if the tenant commences an action to assert the claim within one year after the tenant knew or should have known that the landlord's termination of the tenancy is in violation of the section. And so Barb, in this case, the, the, the tenant decided to wait to the very last minute to notify everybody, correct? Yeah, um, so we were gonna close, I believe, uh, I can't remember if it was like, I think it was very early September and about 10 days prior to closing, they sent us a note or an, an email from their lawyer saying that they were not going to move and that they were suing uh, the landlord and the property manager for damages. <laughs> I can, I, I remember when this happened, we were all like, oh my gosh, this is horrible how this happened. Yeah, it was and awful. Then, it, it put everybody into a tizzy, right? Because you've yeah. got You've got a seller. Actually, the seller was almost the least person harmed at this point, but the buyer was going crazy because they had planned 
they they had a huge plan for this property. They had they, they had, already sold their primary residence, so right. they were homeless at the point. Right. Uh, luckily, this seller had another property that wasn't selling, so I w was able to get them into that property. Um, but it was very scary because these buyers were taking on these tenants that were being very stubborn. You know, I shouldn't call them stubborn. They were put in a bad position by, you know, the landlord and the seller not giving them clear instructions. But, you know, they had time. Anyway, long story short. Yeah, the, um, the was definitely being stubborn, was which was within their rights, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I do think, like, it, we, I don't want to give away the ending. We'll obviously close this deal, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, because Barbara, Barbara did a lot of hard work, but do you think that, you know, having that property for them to move into probably was the key to this thing, not getting worse, correct? Yeah. Because it alleviated a lot of stress for the, for the buyer. I mean, not all of, not all of it. They were very stressed out. Yeah. Um, the seller, you know, was able to give them free rent in his, uh, unoccupied home. And so it just made a big difference to keep them, um, there and be able to renegotiate because it was quite, I mean, you and I chatted for a while i mean it took a while to untangle this mess yeah yeah you had a property manager who who didn't think she did anything wrong you had a seller who was very sure that his that he only works with the best people <laughs> and yeah. it took him a while to come around um and yeah. you had a buyer that wasn't only displaced from their home but they also were people of means they had mm -hmm cars stashed all over the Portland metropolitan area and storage and furniture. And yeah. they had contractors lined up to do the work to this property. I mean, it was a lot of high tension. Um, you know, it's a very stressful situation. And I yeah. have to say, you did a fantastic job keeping it all together by, by and I think it was, I, you tell me, but I think your communication with both parties in this was also a big key to keeping this together. Correct. Yeah. I think we ran into a lot of issues with uh, lawyers, not, I don't know how lawyers do their jobs, but there was not a lot of communication actually happening, like solid, can we get an answer for this and this from the tenants and what would they agree to, what would they not agree to? Um, it took a long time to get to that point. And I, I kind of just had to put my fingers in it and just say, well, you know, shake things up a bit and get some answers out of people. Uh, but finally, we got the tenants to agree legally to uh, move on. And I what the biggest mistake was by the property manager is that she gave improper notice and the seller had said the seller and property manager decided that they didn't owe the relocation or one month's rent fee to these tenants for some reason, even though I had said to them, are you sure? I think that you do owe it. You better check. And they did not And they told me they took care of everything. And that's how we ended up in this massive pickle because they their lawyer decided that that was their in that said you didn't give us proper notice and you didn't pay us therefore we don't have to move yeah and and because of that the statute says the landlord shall be liable to the tenant in an amount equal to three months rent in addition to actual damage sustained by the tenant as a result of the tenancy termination and the tenant has a defense to an action for possession by the landlord so they can stay in the property Mm -hmm. And they can sue for three times the a month's rent and they get actual damage. So it's like a really big penalty to the seller yeah. um, mm -hmm. by this property manager not doing her job correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Which they did in writing. They they asked for all of that. Yeah. And kudos to you. Like so many times when lawyers get involved, our um, our instincts are to not to stop, like let the lawyers deal with it. And sometimes that's right. But like Barbara was smart enough to realize like, hey, I know what's going on here. I know that this isn't just a legal matter. There's more to this. There's this is people's lives and they have pressures. And if we just let the lawyers, you know, win it out, it's not going to yeah. work. So yeah. sticking your nose in there and and keeping it moving really got the deal done and keeping the communication open between the two sides and not making yeah. it adversarial. Like I thought you did a really good job of not painting the seller as a villain or painting the buyer as a villain. I just thought you did a really good job just keeping the lines of communication open and um, and having the idea, I don't know whose idea it was to move them into the um, into the rental, but that was-, that was <laughs> It was on the market to be rented. And I was like, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> let's move your buyers in there because they yeah. desperately need a home. That's right. And he, and the seller was going to be on the hook for that no matter what. The seller 
that a buyer can claim damages, their actual damages in a sale contract, where the seller, they're only to do the earnest money, right? Mm -hmm. So the seller can just claim earnest money when they're wrong, but a buyer gets to actually go after damages. And the damages to this buyer, as you heard, they're, they were... <laughs> They, they were people of means, they had a lot of furniture, they had a lot of cars, they had a lot of stuff, their time was worth money, the damages to the seller beyond what the tenant could have charged them, the buyer could have hit them for even more. And so they were in a really precarious situation. Again, good job keeping it all together. This is a Thank situation you. where dual agency really works because it may not have worked otherwise. Like this may have just blown up on everybody if you had yeah. had somebody in the middle being calm and handling it. Right, yeah. and Barbara doing such a good job of focusing on solution. Yep. So that's why we wanted to talk a little bit about this because not all transactions are easy ones, mm -hmm. um, but we just want to wanted to really highlight your success in overcoming that and focusing yep. on the solution. And this is why this is why we get paid, guys. This is thanks the type for letting of me for every deal on you your shoulder, you Kelly. Many times. <laughs> oh, well, you you kept it together. Right. You're the one who yeah. did all the hard, hard work on that. So, um, good job. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to add that. This is why people need realtors. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've had lots of transactions in my career that kind of fell in my lap and I was able to close them and I didn't do a lot of work. And for every one of those, if you're in the <laughs> business long enough, you're going to have one of those that takes all the skill and patience and every, every other aspect that you had to employ to go back and forth, listen to the attorneys and negotiate a solution because... Kelly's absolutely right. If you would have left that in the hands of the attorneys, usually they don't even work anymore. Everybody gets pitted against each other and the attorneys take posturing positions and, you know, egos get in the way and realtors navigate through all that for a solution, which is, you know, Barbara did a fantastic, fantastic job. job and you got paid. Dwight right. definitely was very helpful in this as well. Dwight and Kelly, I have to say for all the realtors out there, it was <clears throat> without their expertise and guidance. I don't know if I would have had kept the backbone to get through this <laughs> it, was, oh, it was a little rough you had it under control as far as i could tell you did great nice awesome. yeah thank you for sharing barbara yeah, thank you, barbara. Plus, barbara. Hey, thank you. so just in terms of like learning and how it makes you feel as a realtor barbara like how do you feel about yourself getting through that deal getting it done um, I feel good. It, it was definitely the craziest transaction I've ever been through. The longest, the long, the store end of the story was we ended up closing uh, in December. So we went from June to December. So it was a nine month long deal. And it was rough. I mean, it was, there was months where it was every day I was in contact with the buyer and you know, a lot of crying and talking and on and on and on. So yeah, I feel definitely very proud of myself for getting through it. When it was all said and done, it was, you know, champagne for everybody. It was very exciting. <laughs> That's so yeah. cool. Well, you know, I think 95% of awesome. the time, there's a solution to almost every problem we run across. And it's just a matter of keeping mm -hmm. egos suppressed, keeping everybody eyes on the facts, helping them understand what the business decisions they need to, they get to make through the process, like empowering them to understand the process. I think that's how you get these these problems worked out. Yeah. So cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, good job, Barbara. Yeah, thanks for you guys. Yeah.